My name is Susan Doyle Lawrence, and I grew up at 5375 Old West Road, what is now Doyle Road. I'm only related to the old fields by marriage, uh, not by birth. My father, Frank Doyle, had two younger sisters. There was Dad, Frank, then Mirth, and then the youngest was Joy Doyle who married Dick Oldfield. So I knew my first cousin's family as well as I knew my own family. They were like my cousins as much as they were my cousin's cousins. So um, I will often, I think tonight, instead of saying the Reverend Herbert Oldfield, I will probably slip into Uncle Herbert. So let's put the uh, family into a context now, I remember many years ago, I was with a very good bird watcher. And what he said is that everything that the bird is doing is meaningful. It's all for a reason. And he said, if you can watch them, you will soon be able to understand how they're reacting to their environment. And I found the same to be true with human beings as I've looked at uh, different genealogical tales. So let's put the old fields into a perspective so that we can understand better who these people were and why they were doing what they were doing. Now, before we look at the history of the family, I'd like to look at the history of the name itself. So there's two different explanations for the derivation of Oldfield. One, the prosaic one, is of course Anglo-Saxon. Eild meant old, and Feld was an open area cleared of wood. Old field. So variants can be spelled many different ways. Aldfeld, Allfield, Allfell, Offel, Ofield, Oldfeld, De Oldfelder, Del Oldfelder. There's many different variations um, if you're taking the Anglo-Saxon derivation. If you're taking the more romantic one, of course, it is French. Simon de Hauteville, the high village. Simon de Hauteville. So that could become Hauteville, Hauteville, Hovo, Holdfield, Oldfield. Choose whichever one you like. And as with Smiths, every town had a Smith, so every family of Smiths comes from a different place. Um, could be the same with the Oldfields. It could be the same name coming from two different variations in different, uh, different areas of the, the country and the uh, family. So let's begin with the furthest back that I've been able to research, and that's Henry Oldfield, born 1805. Now, the important thing to remember is that in these days and these places, these days and these places, um, there was the rule of primogeniture. So the oldest firstborn, son was the one who would inherit. So he would inherit the lands and buildings, um, cash, um, a pretty, pretty cushy place to be um, in the times of primogeniture. So 1805, this Henry, how many kids have we got there? 13, I think. So this Henry, born in 1805, was actually born in London, Harrow on the Hill, uh, Middlesex. But he very soon came to Ashill and became a prominent farmer. And the 1851 census, he was farming over a thousand acres. He was in charge of 40 laborers, 11 boys, and five women. He was still at Ashill in 1861. And by 1868, he had died and left 
under £12,000 in cash, of course there was the land and buildings, but this was the cash, was just under £12,000. And he left it partly to his widow Sarah, partly to his first son Henry, 1828, and partly to his younger brother Edmund. So Henry becomes an important name in the family, as does the name Edmund. Now his wife Sarah, uh, the censuses say that she was born in 1807, but every census says that she was born in a different place. So she's going to be tough to track down. But she was in Ashrill in 1841, 51, and 61. By 1871, she was now the widow, and she was under re reduced circumstances. Now she is the farmer, farming 418 acres with 18 men, three boys, and two women. But they have now got another business going. She's also running a brickyard with seven men and three boys. Now, the last time I've picked up on her, Sarah, was in 1891, when she was age 84. I haven't found a death record for her yet. So, with children, the first one, Henry, yep, he's set, set for life, he is, the uh, oldest son. We're going to see more of Henry in a little while. Elizabeth, the second child born, also known as Bessie, never married. Now, she played a very important role in the family as the maiden aunt. So as you're looking through the censuses, you will often find that Elizabeth is not living at home. But when you find one of the other families where perhaps there's a one-week-old baby, that's where Aunt Bessie is. She's going around the family, helping out as needed. And at no time did she ever have employment. Um, when she was 60 in the 1891 census, she was 60, single, of her own means, and she was still alive in the 1911 census, still living with her own means. Number three is Edmund, born 1832. He was age nine in the 1841 census, and then I thought he had disappeared. And I was so relieved when he did show up as getting married in 1853. That was a close one. Almost lost him. Number four, Charles, 1834. So in 1861, he was still on his father's farm, but by 1871, he was at a nearby town called Ruffham. He was married by this time, well married, because he married Lady Susan Little. By this time, 1871, there were already three children. His mother-in-law, Lady Eliza Little, was living in the home, and Sister Elizabeth was in the home. There was a one-week-old baby in the family. Now, by 1881, Charles had moved to Stilton, the place of the Stilton cheese. It's in Huntingdonshire. He's now a master bricklayer, bricklayer, and there's another new baby, a baby a week old, and had not yet been named at the time of the census, but the, you pick her up later on other documents, and her name was Eva Keswick. Oldfield. So that looking at that Keswick is going to be really interesting. Where does such an unusual name come from? So um, within a short length of time, there's six children. Um, oh, but Hilda, age five, because there's a new baby in the house, Hilda is living with her grandparents that particular census. Um, so I guess she had to um, have someone else taking care of her while her mom had three little kids at home. Number five is Ellen, born 1836. Um, she was in the 1841 census, age five, and then there was nothing. And I thought, oh dear, lost another one. But no, 1861, she had married William Little. So it sounds like the Littles and the old fields probably had a connection. And by 1861 and a little after, she had seven children. So seven little littles. 
Number six, David, born 1837. In the 1841 census, he was age four, and I've not been able to find any further mention of him. I suspect that he died, but sometimes they come popping up later. Arthur, born 1839. He was age two in the census in 1841, and again, nothing since then. Francis, alias Frank, born in 1840, so he was age one at the 1841 census. Now by 1861, being one of the younger uh, children, he's got to go out there and make a livelihood for himself. So in 1861, he's in Dover, Kent. He's a chemist's assistant. And by 1871, he's in Scarborough, Yorkshire. He is now a pharmaceutical chemist. He's married. He has a five-year-old niece staying at their home with them, one servant, and he now has an assistant chemist under him. So he, he progressed quickly. Number nine is Walter, born 1841. And he is with his father farming until 1871, when he strikes out on his own to Shingham, which is very close to Ashall, and by that time he already has his first five children. Um, Walter is one we're going to come back to later, because he is the one who came out to Manitoba, so he started a line of Canadian old fields. So we're going to have a lot more about Wilt Walter later on. Mary, um, she never married like her oldest sister Bessie. Um, she was a, a student boarding in 1861. In 1871 she was living at home with her widowed mother. She has game with her mother for the next several years, and by 1891, she's on her own, living on her own means, but she did not marry. Eleven is Kate, born 1845, all these children born at Ashall. In 1861, she's at boarding school. 1871, she's 25 and single and living with her mum, and then I can't find Kate after that. Maybe she married. Maybe. Twelve is George, 1848, at Ashall. He's a scholar in the next two censuses, but by 1871 he's 22. He's helping his widowed mother to run the farm and the brickyard. In 1891, where is he? I can't find him. But two of his children in that census are living with George's mother. So I don't know what was happening to them at that time. Now, George was fairly peripatetic, so he could have just up stakes and gone somewhere else. He's a different place every census. And we're going to see George a bit more later, too, because one of his ancestors came out to Saanich. And Annie, the 13th child, born 1852, in boarding school, 1861. 1871, she's living with her mother. By 18, 1911, she's 45 and married. And it's possible she married a Charles Crane. I haven't sorted that out yet. But that's the family as far back as I have it so far. Now remember, primogeniture. We need to look at the next Henry Oldfield, the oldest son, and his family before we start getting into our old fields that are closer to uh, Canada. So the second um, Henry Oldfield, number one is John Henry. So you can see the name Henry is a rising star in this family. Born in Ashall, um, died in 1924 in Victoria. We're going to hear a lot more about John Henry. The second child, Edmund Arthur, Edmund Arthur, born 1858, only lived two months. The next is a set of twins, Edmund and Herbert, born 1859. And by this time, I'm feeling uncomfortable about the name Edward, or Edward and uh, Edmund, pardon me. The twins died either at birth or shortly after. And oh, oh, oh. These children are born at Caldecott. Oh, 
Remember Caldecott Road? This whole generation was born at Caldecott, which is why when John Henry built Norfolk Lodge and there was a nearby road, he named it Caldecott Road. There you go. Um, child number five, Frederick Charles, born 1860. 1871, he's away at boarding school. Now, 1891, he's visiting woolen mills. He marries in 1894, and by 1911, he has a wife, and he has had, there's been two children born, but the 1911 census is precious in that it tells you how many children were born to the couple, how long they were married, how many children were born to the couple, how many have died, and they do the math for you and ask how many are still living. So we know that um, Frederick Charles, that one of his first two born children has already died. But by 1911, he is now a woolen manufacturer. So he's coming up. But again, the younger, the younger sons, they have to make their own way. Sarah Elizabeth, born 1861, was with her parents at Caldecott for the longest time. And then, 1911 census, she's now in Warwickshire, and she's a deaconess of the church. So a single woman, so instead of running around helping the other sisters with their babies, She's gone into the church. Not, um, not a very common prospect in those days. Uh, child number seven, Mary Emma, born 1863. I think she, I've got a birth, uh, a marriage for her in 1888. Haven't proven it out yet, but um, there's been a gap in the censuses where she's hard to find. So we'll see if she got married in 1888. Child number eight, Ernest, 1864. In 1881, he's a baker's apprentice. And I've got a private little joke to myself that he must have burned the buns because in 1901, he is a brick and tile burner. <laughs> Didn't make it in baking, but he's now making it in bricks. Um, he's now an employer. And he is, at this time, 1901, he's a nephew living with Aunt Elizabeth. So if you don't have a place to live, I guess you go and take a, a stand over with Aunt Elizabeth, with Bessie. Child nine, Herbert, born 1865. He was age five in the 1871 census, and then I cannot find him again. So Herbert is now another one of the names that I hate seeing coming up on a census because I wonder how long he and Edmund are going to be around. Child 10, Edwin, born 1868, only lived two weeks. And the final child, number 11, Louisa, born 1869, did marry. She married Charles Edward Simpson and they had three children. Now Charles Edward Simpson will we'll feature later on in a story. He was a, an auctioneer. When, um, when this Henry Oldfield, born 1826, when he died in 1894 at Aschel, he, um, he had been a large landowner um, farming 1,200 acres, farming 1,347 acres, um, always large properties. But when he died in 1894, his estate was just under 6,000 pounds cash. And he divided it, very strangely, between William Herbert Salter, an auctioneer, and Andrew Arthur Young, a farmer and I can find no connection yet of those people to the family. But auctioneer, okay, Simpson auctioneer, it's Salter and Simpson auctioneers, there's probably going to be a connection that comes becomes evident at some point. So I think, let's just see where we're at here. 
Okay, now what I'm going to do this evening is to read to you a three and a half page story of the Oldfield family in Saanich that was presented by, prepared, pardon me, by Reverend Herbert Oldfield in 2005. So what you have is one of the Oldfields reporting on the lives of his grandfather, his father, his own generation. And he, it was written fairly recently, in 2005. So I'm going to start reading what Uncle Herbert wrote, but I'll interject with um, commentaries and further genealogies. So Uncle Herbert begins, the Old Fields in Saanich, John Henry Oldfield. John Henry, eldest son of Henry Oldfield of Ashill, Norfolk, England, was born there in 1860, second in a family of eight. The family were landowners managing large estates. They would decide which crops to plant and then sell them using the proceeds to maintain the farm and housing and to care for the families on the estate. Now, Uncle Herbert, please forgive me, but most of what you've written in your first sentence has been proven to be incorrect. Sorry, old chap. Um, John Henry was not born at Ashall. He was born at Caldicott. He wasn't born in 1860. He was born the 7th of February, 1857. He wasn't second in a family of eight. He was first in a family of 11, unless there was a baby born before him, in which case he was second in a family of 11. But about them being landovers, that we can, that we can stick with. So second paragraph. The family bought a sugar plantation in Suriname, later Dutch Guiana, on the north coast of South America, and John Henry went out to manage it. I just Ah yes, there's a story. There's a story. Sugar plantation. I mentioned that my father Frank Doyle had two younger sisters. One was Mirth. One was Joy, who married into the Oldfield family. When my cousin Mirth was an instructor of nursing at McGill University, this would be in the 60s or 70s, she was surprised to find a student in her class with the surname Oldfield, who was black and had English as her second language. She spoke some sort of, um, perhaps, um, a Germanic language or perhaps a um, Romance language, but she certainly had an accent. So Aunt Mirth took her aside one day and said, I'm interested to know how you came to have the, the name Oldfield. And she said, well, she said, all of my people were slaves on the sugar plantations. And when they were freed, they had to take a surname and we all took the surname of our owner. So at some point, maybe this Oldfield family, maybe other Oldfield families, remember there's lots of them around, but certainly they were slave owners if you go back far enough. So we're back to John Henry. Now he found the equatorial climate and jungle country oppressive and his health suffered. An English friend came to visit and suggested that John Henry accompany him on a visit to Canada on his way home. So they journeyed together to New Orleans, then by train up the Mississippi Valley to Dakota, not yet North and South Dakota, just plain Dakota, where they drove by stagecoach to Manitoba where he stayed with his uncle, Walter Oldfield, who had brought his 17 children across Canada when the Canadian Pacific Railway was completed. And Uncle Walter was living in Birds Hill, 
south of the Selkirk colony and a little north of the present city of Winnipeg. The open prairie was more like his native Norfolk and the shooting of ducks, prairie chicken and grouse was like that of his home. So he continued to England to announce he intended to give up the sugar business and begin to develop the farmlands of Canada. His cousin Edmund from Birds Hill, Manitoba, took over the Suriname plantation, marrying a black lady, Ellie Ella Desi, an accomplished musician, pianist, and singer, speaking several languages. In time, they sold the plantation to Tate and Lyle, who were consolidating sugar production in the Caribbean, and they retired to England where they soon discovered that English ladies do not invite black ladies to afternoon tea. So they moved to Holland, where they became part of the musical and social life of the day. We now need John Henry's family. No, I'll tell you what, let's, let's just leave it for a moment. So John Henry Oldfield developed his real estate business by moving among his English friends and encouraged them to come and take up land in Canada. Then he would travel with the group to New York and by train to Dakota and by stagecoach to Manitoba where he settled them on suitable land and he kept in touch with most of them. They were always welcome at his home in Winnipeg, and on moving to British Columbia, he built a large house with six bedrooms plus servants' rooms on what is now Oldfield Road, where his Manitoba friends continued to visit, especially in shooting season, staying sometimes for months. Winnipeg became a great center when the railway crossed the Red River at that point. The old Fort Garry was demolished and Portage Avenue became one of Canada's great streets. John Henry Oldfield was in the center of buying and developing the land. One corner bastion of the old fort remains in the garden behind the old Fort Garry Hotel, crumbling and covered with blackberries when I last saw it but now I hear restored. The offices of the firm, Oldfield, Kirby, and Gardner, still stand at 264 Portage Avenue. And the Fort Gary Hotel is where my grandfather Doyle uh, worked when he came out, brought here by the CPR, they wanted workers, so he was working at the Fort Garry Hotel at the time. And when I was at Winnipeg in 2003, I made a point of checking out the Fort Garry Hotel and the offices of Oldfield, Kirby, and Gardner. Winnipeg became a hub of business and transportation, and the city's population grew. John Henry Oldfield met and married Emma Louise Inman, a descendant of the Empire Loyalist family of Van Norman. Four children, Kathleen, Clarence, Herbert, and Edmund, grew up in Winnipeg. Clarence and Herbert were sent to Radley College in Parkgate, Cheshire, England, and Kathleen was sent to Holland for two years where she lived with her uncle Edmund and his black wife, whom she called Paul Aunt Polly. This was the cousin who had managed the Suriname plantation, where the family had continued to visit as an escape from the Winnipeg cold winters. So if you don't like Winnipeg, you don't fly off to Hawaii. Mm -hmm. You take the steamer to Suriname and spend the balmy uh, winters down there. Now, it's mentioned that John Henry married Emma Louise, a descendant of the Empire Loyalist family of Van Norman. Um, and Emma was born in 1861, and when you look on her birth documents, it says Upper Canada. It predates Confederation. 
So this family, going back just a few short generations, um, the Selkirk colony, um, it's just a glimpse into the history of, of, that, of that time. And uh, on one of the birth certificates for one of the four children, I forget which one, um, she must have been discombobulated because she, she wrote Emma as the first name of the mum, and then she wrote Van Norman, so the um, people weren't sure if she was married or single or what, but she was certainly married at that time, but she slipped and wrote Van Norman instead of um, her maiden name. So let's look at John Henry's family. Much shorter this time, only four. Uh, we've got Kathleen, the token maiden aunt. Born 1886, lived with her, um, with her, with her parents until they were deceased, then continued to live in Norfolk Lodge. Henry Clarence brought his family, um, joined her there in, in the big home. But she was born in Winnipeg. All four of the children were born in Canada. She was born January the 1st, 1886. Henry Clarence, born 1889. How many of you actually remember seeing Henry Clarence Oldfield. Do you remember? Yes. So he was small of stature, and he had a hump on one side. Now, he, he had suffered from as a child and had to leave school. And I've always wondered if that was a genetic deformation of his spine, or if it was one of the complications of his having polio as a child. But uh, Henry Clarence, um, the boys were sent over to Radley College in Cheshire, so they never got to come home, as we'll, we'll see in just a minute. And uh, Henry Clarence died in 1966. The third child born, Edmund, in 1892 in Winnipeg, he uh, signed up for the World War I. His attestation papers say that he was a steam engineer and cold storage. We've found several of his border crossings. He was one of these peripatetic ones. He was always traveling somewhere. Um, he was an active alcoholic. His nephews all called him Juicy. He was always in the juice. However, we can't really judge other people he signed up for World War I, as did his younger brother, Herbert, and Herbert was killed in World War I. So some things drive a man to drink, perhaps. Um, I don't feel that anyone can be judgmental um, of another person and how they cope with the circumstances of their life. I have found a, a burial, a death and burial for our Juicy in Florida. Who knows why he was in Florida. But he was continually traveling, crossing the, um, the border between the US and Canada. And all of those are recorded. So we're getting um, quite a picture of his uh, comings and goings. The great BC gold rush began in 1898, when Clarence was 10. And Victoria began to fill up with gold seekers and those to meet their needs. So John Henry began to look westward for new real estate activity. He bought 300 acres on Oldfield Road without ever seeing it as an excellent building site. At this time, Clarence became infected with infantile paralysis, polio nowadays, and ordered to leave school. This, remember, he's at boarding school in England, and to live an outdoor life. So John Henry suggested he come home and begin to clear the trees from the Vancouver Island property. This was most welcome to Clarence. He did not enjoy the English school, and it was impossible in those days to get home for holidays. So he circulated among Oldfield cousins in England instead. 
One summer he spent with his uncle, Henry Simpson, of Salter Simpson Auctioneers, where he gained an appreciation for farm animals and crops as they came up for sale. And another year he stayed with George Oldfield, who was managing Walter Oldfield's farm at Fulden Harl, and where he met Doris, his future wife. On hearing he must leave school, Clarence took a short course in prospecting at the London Polytechnic Institute, thinking that gold mining would be in his future. But although Prospect Lake was only a few miles away, and at the time there was a small operating gold mine in what is now Goldstream Park, farming was to become his life instead. So we've got um, Henry Clarence spending a summer with Uncle Henry Simpson of Salter Simpson Auctioneers. Now, his Aunt Louisa, remember that's his child, what, about 13 of the previous generation, she had married a Charles Edward Simpson. I'm not able to find a Henry Simpson, so it may be just the wrong first name um, in this document. But the name Salter also gets married into the family um, in another generation. Though the firm remained in Winnipeg, John Henry Oldfield became active in Victoria. He became agent for Crédit Foncier, a French company who wished to develop a high-class housing estate in Victoria. And he acquired the Uplands Farm, which he began to lay out according to their wishes. It was an attractive development. All services were underground, and there were stringent regulations regarding the houses that could be built. It is still a desirable and fashionable area. Unfortunately, with the beginning of World War I, the French company was unable to transfer money from France. So John Henry Oldfield continued to develop it, selling lots in order to pay the taxes and expenses, until finally, in 1922, Crédit Foncier withdrew from the affair and John Henry Oldfield continued to manage the development. John Henry formed a friendship with Samuel McClure, a well-known architect who planned many of the Uplands home. And he began to plan Norfolk Lodge, the future Oldfield home, and one of four he designed for John Henry. Mrs. Oldfield and the family began the move from Winnipeg, living for a year in a house built by Mr. McClure on Pemberton Road while Norfolk Lodge was under construction. K.J., known as Jack Oldfield, came from England to be involved in building the lodge, his sister Isabel coming with him, and their older sister Kitty coming at the close of the war with her husband, Bernard Edwards, a farm manager who managed Dr. O.M. Jones' lavender farm at Machosan, and later the Miller Ranch at Rocky Point. These were brother and sisters of Doris Oldfield, who by now was married to Clarence Oldfield. So this is where we connect two branches of the Oldfield family by marriage. So we've got George Oldfield and his family. So first born, Alexander George, always known as Alex, born 1878. He was a bank clerk, I'll use the, the English pronunciation, a bank clerk. And at the time of his death, he left 6,000 pounds. That's about all I know about him. Number two is Kate, or Kitty. 1879, so she's the one who, who married Uncle Bernard, I'll call him, because that's what we always called him, and moved to Machosan and Rocky Point. Number three, a daughter, Florence Sarah, born 1880. In 1911, I've come across her at the St. Bartholomew's Hospital. She, Florence Sarah was the Florence Nightingale of the family. Number four, Gertrude, born 1882. 
She was christened and then died shortly after. Five, Bertha, born 1883. She married Mr. Abbott, and um, one of her children came out and was living at Brentwood Bay. I met Mike Abbott when I was, when I was growing up. And Bertha died in 1979 in Suffolk. But she only visited, and we've got her, um, her travel papers, but she never uh, stayed in, in Canada. Child number six, Isabella Mary, 1885, always known just as Isabel. She married Shirley Morgan Hobbs. Now, Shirley was a masculine name at that time. In 1911, she's the art mistress at Temple School, and the youngest daughter in the family, Jillian, is one of the students there. Now, Isabel did come out to Canada. Um, so Isabel Hobbs, you may be familiar with her paintings, mostly of dogwoods. You may have seen her, they became quite well known, um, mostly about this size, beautiful paintings of dogwoods. And she actually was able to make a living through her art. So she was accomplished. Number seven is Doris Octavia. Now how can someone be named Octavia if they are the seventh child? So I think we are missing one. I have not been able to find another child born there. I don't know when there was time to have another one. Maybe 1883, between Gertrude and Bertha, maybe? Just time to squeeze one more in? Or between Florence and Gertrude? Maybe. But yes, there we go. Isabella, Mary, and Doris. Yes. So maybe there was one more just before Doris. But she was named Doris Octavia, uh, born 1889. So, do you recall the first Henry that we had up here? And he, the oldest one was Henry, and from this Henry we've got down to Henry Clarence Oldfield. George is the eleventh child of the thirteen children in that family. His daughter is Doris Octavia, born the same year as Henry Clarence. So because they're spread over 20 years, the older children have gained a generation already. So rather than being born in the same year and first cousins, they are first cousins once removed. Um, Henry Clarence is a generation ahead of Doris, although they're born in the same year. So that's their genealogical relationship is First cousins, but once removed. We've got Kenneth John. He's the builder who came out to help with building Norfolk Lodge. And then Gillian, born 1897. And she's got an unusual middle name. It's either Armore or Atmore. And she was born in Brighton. Why she was born in Brighton, I don't know yet, but I intend to find out. So that's, that's for future fun. So by 1912, the Oldfields moved into Norfolk Lodge, which became a social center for Manitoba visitors and a busy place during the hunting season. Among them were Ted Winerls and James Pito, who had come out from Norfolk with John Hendry to take up land many years ago. Many Winnipeg friends came out, including the lady whose entire career had been as receptionist clerk in the Winnipeg office, and many more business associates. Many would stay for days or weeks. At that time, the Saanich Municipal Game Farm raised over 5,000 pheasants, grouse, partridge, and quail every year for the hunting season. Prominent figures were invited if they came to Victoria. One of these was E. Cora Hind, the well-known financial editor of the Winnipeg Tribune, who had aggressively entered what was at that time the male preserve of business. She appeared in a well-tailored pinstriped suit. In the 1920s, the first woman I had seen wearing trousers. And following the seven-course dinner, 
when the cigars were handed out, she produced a small black cheroot, which was lighted by one of the men. And she went with the men into the living room instead of withdrawing with the ladies into the drawing room. Another less auspicious meeting was with when Nellie McClung, fresh from her conquests in Manitoba and Alberta, came to live in her new home on Lantern Lane in Gordon Head. The old field table was always set with tumblers and a large glass jug of water, but also with wine glasses, while decanters of red and white wine were set at opposite corners of the table. Mrs. McClung, however, was still breathing fire from her temperance crusades, and though she didn't take out her axe and chop the legs off the dining room table, she gave Mr. Oldfield a stern opinion of people who made liquor available to their guests and encouraged them to drink with their meals. As a result, the Oldfields lost interest in the McClungs. John Henry Oldfield made his own red wines, mostly cherry and plum. It was at this time that the Winnipeg winter holidays in Jamaica were now changed to the trips from Victoria to Japan. And for me, that sentence explains many of the artifacts that are in the beautiful curio cabinet that has been handed down um, through the old fields. There's much um, chinoiserie, Japanese items, um, lots of curios. So now we need the Henry Clarence Oldfield family. So Clarence, Henry Clarence was al always known as H.C. or Clarence. Clarence Oldfield bought 30 acres of land between his father's property and Elk Lake and managed the large farm, which he called Norfolk Lodge Ranch, while John Henry Oldfield ran his real estate business from his office in the top floor gazebo or belvedere of Norfolk Lodge until his unfortunate accidental death in 1927. So the gentleman was checking on the pump house. Water was always a problem up at Norfolk Lodge. There was a well, which was always inadequate at any time of the year. They would collect the rainwater off the roof. They would keep that in cisterns, which they used um, for, for other than drinking water. They used the, the water from the cisterns. And um, John Henry was checking out the uh, pump house when he had, a, he had an accident which led to his death. So we've got the Oldfield family. Um, as we know them. So, well, not quite. Um, we've got the firstborn. So they were married in 1912. The next year, Henry George was born, and he only lived for 17 hours. So uh, an auspicious name, Henry George, but he didn't make it. Um, Henry John Herbert is the one that we know as Herbert. He didn't use the, his two first names. Born 1914. Richard Clarence, my Uncle Dick, born 1915. Um, Uncle Jim, I haven't got a birth date for him yet. No problem, I'll find it. And Edward, I didn't even know his name was Edward. He was always Uncle Toby. I never, ever, ever heard anybody call him Edward. It was always Uncle Toby, the baby of the family. And I've got a question mark up there, which B, you just might be interested, because I'm going to read an article from a local newspaper that doesn't have a year on it. RJH initials of hospital baby. The Board of Directors of the Provincial Royal Jubilee Hospital last night were much interested to learn that the little daughter 
of Mr. and Mrs. Clarence Oldfield of Elk Lake, who was the first baby born in the new hospital, has been christened Ruth Joan Helen, her initials being the same as those of the hospital. Mm -hmm. The little girl was born on March the 18th, but what year? We don't know. I found no birth record for her in British Columbia. The first boy born at the hospital was George Norman Straith, son of Mr. and Mrs. George Straith, who came into the world on March 22. So it's a bit of a mystery that uh, we hope to sort out. Now with the, um, with the Oldfield family, um, the four boys survived. But what happened to the little girl? I don't know. Now we're at the end of Uncle Herbert's story of his family. He says, at this point, I should include a word about John Henry Oldfield's uncle, Walter Oldfield, who came to Canada a little earlier, and whose 17 children dispersed widely. Walter, I understand, returned to his English home at Folden Hall when his family at Springfield and Birds Hill, that's Manitoba, were grown. Now, as we shall see as we look at Walter Oldfield's family of 17 children, um, it's, that sentence is not exactly factually accurate. So, it was not 17 children who came to Canada. It was 13 at that point. So, the first one we have, so we have Walter and his wife, Mary Jane Taylor. Mabel, the first one born, and this is another mystery that we need to solve, because when she was christened in 1876, clear as day, it says she was born in 1863. That's three years before her, her parents were born, and three years before, were married, pardon me, and three years before their first child was born. So, I don't know. I really don't know. That we'll have to sort out. Edith Mary, 1866. She lived to 1900. Third, Edmund. He's the one who married Ella Desi in Suriname and wound up in Holland. Number four, Horace Taylor, born in 1868. Horace Taylor is the father of Basil, Barbara, and Brian Oldfield, mm -hmm. the family at Prospect Lake. So finally, we're getting people that we know um, joining the family tree here. Number five, now what a name, Whiffen Edgar. Whiffen, I can't even find it as a surname, born 1870. Um, he came to Manitoba in 1881, so all these kids that were, were born by that, by that time, it, they show up on the 1881 census in Manitoba, including Whiff and Edgar, and then he drops from the scene. I don't know what happened to him. Ida Amelia, born 1871, still alive in 1868. She participated in the Boer War as a nurse. Uh, child number seven, Frank. Um, he died in the Boer War, so his sister was a nurse, he was killed. Uh, number eight, Arthur, born 1873, can't find him. Nora, number nine, born in 1874, I can't find Norma, Nora. Number 10, Lewis, 1875, I don't know where he went to. Uh, number 11, Beatrice, born 1877. She married an Edward Ashwood and had a child. 
Number 12, Mabel. And so remember, this is the second Mabel. We've already had one who obviously was already dead by 1879 when the second Mabel was born. She married an Ernest Cottrell. Number 13 is Elsie, born 1880. She married a Berriage Grenville George Dupa in 1900. And now number 14, Helen Maud. She was born 1882 in Manitoba. The next one, William Septimus. Septimus, he was the seventh boy in the family, born 1883 in Manitoba. He married Christine Connor and died here in Esquimalt in 1964. Ruth, born Ashel, so now back in 1885, they're back in England. Another baby born, Ruth, born at Ashel, and the final one, Reginald, born in 1886. So a lot that I have not been able to account for. Um, I don't know if they died or if they just simply part of the old field diaspora. I do not know. I do not know. So these are his comments, Herbert's comments, about the family we've just seen. So Edith Mary married Richard Mason Palmer, who became provincial horticulturist for BC and later for the Dominion of Canada. They lived at Lake Hill and later in Cobble Hill, where he bred gladioli. His son Dick managed the Summerland Experimental Farm in the 1920s. Then second child Edmund, he's the one who went to Suriname to manage the sugar plantation and retired to Holland. Horace, and this is the one who fathered our family of Prospect Lake, Oldfields. Horace went to New Zealand, I believe, and then returned to live at Prospect Lake. He married Mildred James, whose father, Percy James, was influential in founding St. Columbus Church at Strawberry Vale. His sons, Basil and Brian, started and ran the Oldfield service station on West Saanich Road. Ida was matron of a field hospital in South Africa during the Boer War. I met her in England when she was 97. Frank went to South Africa where he died in the Boer War. Arthur went to Egypt. Lewis took up land in the USA. Beatrice married Edward Ashwood of Vineland, BC. Helen married Reg Mace of Vancouver. William married Christine O'Connor, which is Christine Connor, and lived at Duncan and Victoria. His son, Bill, lives on Piers Island. So that's the end of what Herbert Oldfield had to say about his family back in 2005. Now for me, I have one closing comment. It's where um, Belford is writing in The Daily Colonist, and she said that the Oldfield family can be found in Canada, the US, Zululand, New Zealand, Australia, virtually around the world. She said that an Oldfield from British Columbia could virtually travel to any country and sit down to a meal with one of his relatives. And I believe that's probably not too far off the mark. I had a strange feeling at one point in the research when one of the children of one of these generations married someone with the surname Piper in Suffolk in one of the towns where I have pipers in my genealogy. And I thought, uh-oh, Susan, you keep up with this, you're going to find you're related to yourself. You're going to find you're your own 64th cousin three times removed. <laughs> <laughs> 
that's what it's like with genealogy. You don't know what you're going to find. But it's a wonderful ride. It's a wonderful ride. Now, I do want to um, thank some sources or acknowledge them, including the Prospect Lake Historical Society, the Saanich Archives, the Saanich Pioneer Society Archives, Victoria Genealogical Society and their Resource Center, FamilySearch.org, the LDS Family History Center, Ancestry.com, Vital Statistics BC, The Daily Colonist, The Victoria Times, and I gratefully acknowledge all of the Oldfield ancestors, all of our ancestors, and I'm thankful for their stories and their lives. Thank you. Thank you. So back to the quiz, we now know it's Caldicott Road, we now know it was named after where John Henry, the developer, where he lived, Norfolk Lodge, Samuel McClure, and he also designed Sunny Hill across the road. Um, the other questions, what names would you not want to have? Herbert. You don't want to be a Herbert, and you don't want to be an Edmund. But you want to be Henry, you want to be the firstborn. Yeah. Was that all of the questions that were on the quiz? I think so. I think we're done. But I'll be around for a little while, you know, if people have questions. You've had difficulty getting info on the, the more recent relatives, but the past ones are so available. What's yes. going on there? Okay, one reason is privacy legislation. So on Vital Statistics BC, you can get deaths up to 1992, but you can only get marriages up to 1915, and births only up to, I think it's 1908, something like that. No? A bit later. I don't know. But because of privacy legislation, you can only get the censuses up to 1911, and just in about a week, they're going to release the 1921 censuses. And all the genealogists, and they're going to crash some sites, they really are, because everyone's just waiting for the 1921 census to see where all these people that we had pinned down in 1911, what have they been doing for the next 10 years? There's going to be a feeding frenzy. But that's that's part of it, Joanne. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs>